Hello, everyone. This is Gil Price. Uh, I am the U.S. Medical Director for Antisense Therapeutics. What I thought we would do today, I would share with you a little bit about Antisense as a company <clears throat> and then speak with you uh, about some recent study data that we have developed and the encouraging results that we believe that we have that will allow us to move forward uh, with further development of our drug uh, in the treatment of Duchenne. So Antisense is an Australian-based, publicly traded biotech company. We have advanced uh, stage pipeline, uh, and specifically, we have advanced in our clinical trial work uh, to now phase two in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So a little bit about our drug and the mechanism of action and why we believe that our drug is going to be an important tool in this box that we're developing uh, around multiple approaches to the treatment of Duchenne um, and hopefully at some point the cure of Duchenne. So our drug is an antisense oligonucleotide um, to integrin alpha-4 RNA, and this is important, CD49. All of those big words, by the way, just tell us what, what are those things. Those are proteins on cells that allow one cell to talk to another cell. Specifically, CD49, as it turns out, uh, DMD patients have a greater number of circulating T cells with high levels of CD49. So the idea is, is if we can suppress that, we can have a positive effect. Interestingly, corticosteroids appear to have no effect on CD49 in terms of T cell numbers. Steroid treatment does not modulate CD49 expression on T cells uh, in MS or in DMD. Non-ambulant DMD patients have the greatest number of CD49. So you can kind of get the understanding here when you think of those things of why, we're, why we believe that we can have a positive impact in Duchenne. So let me share with you the results of our recent study. So this was a phase two open label study to determine the safety and efficacy and pharmacokinetic profile in weekly dosing in patients with non, patients with non ambulatory Duchenne. The primary objective, of course, was to just show that we were safe and well tolerated. The secondary endpoints, though, that were really important were, were we able to modulate lymphocytes in the way that we anticipated? What was the PK profile? What were the effects in terms of functional capacity, respiratory function, and quality of life? So the design of the study was a single center open labeled study conducted in Murdoch Children's Research Institute in Melbourne, Australia. The small study, there were only nine participants. Um, the target population participants were diagnosed with DMD and have been non-ambulatory for at least three months. Their ages ranged from 10 to 18. Their body weight was more than 25 kilograms and less than 65. So in terms of meeting the primary endpoint, which was really the goal, it was generally safe and well tolerated. There were no serious adverse events. No participants had to be withdrawn from the study. There were a total of 136 treatment emergent events. And let me just say, to some, that may sound like a significant number, but I just would remind you, that an adverse event is considered when there is any change from the baseline data. So that in a study that I'm currently conducting, there are 8,000 adverse events or 8,000 changes from the baseline data. So when you think about 136 in this population in nine boys, that's really not so significant in terms of just the change from their baseline data to create something now that we're calling an adverse event, maybe just a little misleading. The most commonly reported treatment emergent adverse event 
were injection site erythema. There was some skin discoloration and injection site pain. Not surprising. All injection site reactions and skin discoloration were reported as mild. Participants were followed up to monitor their skin discoloration um, and erythema. Four participants were resolving, two participants in all of the study population um, were good at the end of the study. So in this slide, um, it, th there's a lot going on in this slide. It looks like uh, a spaghetti. These lines can take a look like spaghetti. But what I would just point out is that the mean observed across multiple parameters following ATL 1102 treatment suggests improvements in reduction or in declines um, that you would expect in, in these patients over a six month period. Specifically, we were stable, were improved in grip and pinch strength. And that's what these lines point out. Now, so we have the actual study data that pointed out, but one of the things that we have done and we illustrate on this slide is that when we compare our data to the world's reported data or published data, we actually, again, show statistically significant improvements um, in all of those parameters, such as grip strength, uh, et cetera. And th this slide points that out nicely. So in terms of muscle strength, the MRI assessment of muscles uh, of the dominant forearm showed the mean change in percent of fat fraction was slightly reduced or stable across the three muscle groups and overall average fat fraction. That's important. This finding was further supported by the reductions in fat, the percent of fat fraction observed in the MRI uh, proximal and distal readings. The observed stabilization is expected in the natural course, of, is not expected in the natural course of disease. So in other words, that number goes down. We know that, we're certain of that. And what we were able to, to illustrate is that with our drug on board, that number stabilized. So if you take a look at what Dr. Riccati has said on the right-hand side of the slide, based on the MRI data from the study, the observed stabilization in the percent of fat fraction with ATL1102 treatment would not be expected in the natural course of disease, even under corticosteroid treatment. She goes on to say, the stabilization of fat fraction percentage combined with the observed maintenance increase of remaining muscle area is suggestive that ATL1102 effect could preserve contractile muscle mass. That's an important statement for us and we're encouraged by it. So in conclusion, ATL1102 appears to be generally safe and well tolerated in non-ambulant boys. Uh, it is a novel antisense drug developed for the treatment of inflammation, which uh, that exacerbates in muscle fiber when muscle fibers are damaged. So we knock that down. The data from the study show apparent improvement in muscle strength, observed mean change from baseline uh, at 24 weeks of dosing with ATL1102 as assessed again by grip and pinch. The data is also suggestive of improvement mu muscle function as assessed by performance of upper limb test, where seven of nine participants have demonstrated clinically meaningful improvements of, or stabilization in their pulse scores. Very important. And then from our MRI, the data suggests stabilization of percentage of fat and muscles and preservation of functional mass. Again, you wouldn't have expected that. These are promising results. And if you take a look at the bottom statement made by Professor Thomas Voigt, uh, who's the director at NIHR in the UK, the data certainly suggests an overall stabilization in disease progression, at the very least which of itself is a very positive clinical outcome 
MRI data confirms that the positive changes in muscle and cellular level and supports the observed physical stabilization improvements in muscle strength and function. The consistency of positive clinical relevant effects of ATL-1102 treatment across muscle measures of structure, strength, and function are very pleasing and provide great encouragement for the treatment of non-ambulant patients with DMV. And we agree with his comments. So with that said, our plan is to uh, aggressively uh, move forward uh, with the continued development of this drug uh, and hopefully be an important piece in the puzzle of the treatment of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So against the backdrop of these encouraging results, if you have questions, feel free to contact Mark Diamond, our Chief Executive Officer in Australia. Or if you are interested, either as an advocacy group or an investor, please feel free to contact our US representative, Aaron Cox, at these numbers. Again, thank you to PPMD. We're grateful that you allow us to make this presentation in this time. And we look forward to our next opportunity to be with you.